Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. So yesterday, out of nowhere, Ambernic released a front end for the Android interface on the Ambernic RG353P. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't really use the Android interface on the RG353P. And that's because this device can dual boot into both Linux or Android, and I greatly prefer the Linux custom firmwares over the Android operating system. But as you can see, this interface is very similar to an emulation station style interface, which I prefer on Linux. And so I decided to update my Android build and then show this off in a video. Now, the reason why Ambernic is releasing this front end probably has to do with their next upcoming device, the RG353V, as you can see here. And this should be out in the next few weeks, and as you can see in their marketing materials, they're showing off this front end already. And since I think that this vertical device will be the same specs as the RG353P, I think they decided to just roll it out early with this unit as well. So a couple things before we get started, you have to wipe the Android system on your device in order to make this update. So if you have anything precious on there, I would definitely make sure that you back it up. Now, sadly, my next point here is that this new Android build still doesn't come with the Google Play Store. And it's kind of a shame because I really wish they would focus on getting that up and running as opposed to a new front end. So when it comes down to it, you will have to sideload your own apps or you'll have to use something like the Aurora Store to get everything loaded. Now, there are some tricks to get the Google Play Store working on this device, but it's a pretty advanced tutorial, but I'll still leave it linked in the video description if you're interested. Anyway, I'm totally getting ahead of myself here, so let's go ahead and dive in. Now, first thing we need is the files for all this setup. You can get it one of two ways. One is directly via Ambernic's YouTube page, and the other is through win.ambernic.com. I'll leave all this linked in the video description. Anyway, the link will take you to a Google Drive page, and there'll be four files, as you can see here. What I recommend doing is downloading all four of them. The update.image file is going to be the largest one at 3.7 gigs, and two of them are actually just PDF tutorials that I'm actually going to go through here in this video, so you can download them if you want, but not necessary. And finally, they provide a tool to allow you to flash that image file to an SD card. So to give you a quick look at those PDF files, you can see they're right here, super simple. They just kind of walk you through this process, which I'm doing here in this video. And let's face it, the translation on these is pretty terrible too. So you're probably not gonna get any value out of this anyway. Either way, here I am on the computer with all four of those files. First thing you're gonna wanna do is unzip the SD disk tool. And again, we're gonna use this tool to flash that image file onto an SD card. So you're also gonna need a spare SD card in order to run this as well. Anyway, once you've unzipped it, it'll make a folder here as you can see, and then you just want to open up that SD firmware tool. Now, one thing about Ambernic, they don't have a great attention to detail. So as you can see here, it actually opens up in Chinese. But luckily, I just experimented a little bit and was able to change the language to English. What you want to do is open up the config file with a text editor. And as you can see here, it has an option for number two being English. So what you want to do is go onto this line that says selected and change it from one to two. Next, just go ahead and save that file, close it out, and then also close out the app. Now, next time you open it up, it'll be in English. So there you go. I would pat yourself on the back right now because we just hacked into an app. Anyway, all you have to do at this point is just click on the firmware button and then navigate to that update file. From there, I just double check that you have your SD card showing up here at the top and then press the create button. It's going to ask you, do you really want to do this? And you say, yeah, man, I want to do it. It'll probably take about five minutes altogether to flash the firmware onto this SD card. Anyway, once you're done with that, go ahead and eject the SD card and then put it into the first SD slot of your device. I would also recommend taking out that second SD card and then power on the RG353P. Now this process itself will take quite a long time. I would say upwards of 10 minutes to install the system update. Anyway, you'll see a wall of text after a while. Just go ahead and eject the SD card from the device and it'll reboot itself. After that reboot, it's gonna go into the Android side and it'll do one more configuration. This will probably take another three minutes or so. Anyway, once that's done, you're good to go. You now have the new version of Android from Ambernic. Now to access that new front end, you wanna swipe down from the top and you can see there's a little Ambernic logo that says normal. If you click on that, it'll say game mode and then that'll give you that new front end. Now, when you first boot it up, it's going to give you a warning about how it needs to configure everything. And even though this is written in English, I'm not really sure what they're trying to get at right here. Either way, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put in the second SD card for my device. Now, this was originally made for the Jealous operating system, so it works in Linux, but it'll also work on the Android side too. Anyway, once you hit confirm, it's gonna go through and reconfigure everything specifically for this front end. 
In particular, it's going to extract a version of RetroArch, which I think has already been built with the hotkeys and everything. Either way, this process will take another two to three minutes. Anyway, after that's all done, you can go ahead and press the F button to back out of RetroArch. And then as you can see here, it's showing all of our different systems. Now, if you go into the systems, as you can see here, at least for me, it didn't have any of the games actually added yet. So we're probably gonna have to manually configure that for every one of the systems. To get that to work, you wanna press the select button while in the game menu. And then from there, you wanna navigate over to the game game settings tab. Within here you can see there's an expected game path. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the plus sign here and I'm going to add my own path to the second SD card. And then I'll navigate down to the NES section. And then here you have to tap on the checkbox with your finger and then press select with your finger as well. After that you can press start searching for games. Now when we press B to back out of the menu, you can see all of my games are listed here, but they're not in any order. You can see they're not in alphabetical order or anything else. That's kind of weird. On top of that, I wasn't able to figure out how to add all of the box art. So right now it's just a text menu. Either way, when you start it up, it's going to ask you, do you want to start a new game or an old game? I think this is asking you if you want to start a save state. Either way, I'm going to select new game because it's my first time using it, but I'll hand it to them. You know, as soon as I started up the game, all of the buttons were configured correctly. And it's also scaling to full screen. Now, probably my favorite thing Thing about this entire setup is that to get out of a game it's super simple. All you have to do is hold down on the F button for a couple seconds. And so honestly that's pretty handy. You don't have to memorize any sort of hotkeys. But admittedly it is weird that none of these games are in any sort of order. Now if you hold down the select button while in the main menu it'll bring up this menu instead. And if you hold on to the select button again it'll bring up this other menu here. Now in this menu, what you can do is you can select and deselect the systems you want to see on that front end. So for example, I'm not going to play Master System games or CPS system games here on Android. So this gives you an opportunity to remove the systems you don't want to see in that main interface. Now of course in Linux on the emulation station side, it'll only show you the systems that are playable because they have ROMs in the folder. And so this is one extra step, but it's not that bad. So now let's try a system that doesn't rely on RetroArch. Let's do PSP next. And under emulator settings, you can see here, it also has the option of choosing between different emulators. I'm gonna stick with the standalone PSP one. Anyway, after that, I'm gonna add the PSP folder to my games list, and yeah, now all the games are showing up. But again, they're in no sort of order at all. Now, when starting up a PSP game, you know, the first thing you're probably gonna notice, the touchscreen controls are showing up, and it's stretched to full screen four by three. To get into the PSP menu, you can press the F button, and yeah, sure enough, they didn't change the language back to English when they made this image. So let's go ahead and blindly navigate through here. I think it's the second menu to get to the settings, and then the very bottom menu is the system settings. Let's just get and say it's the first one available. And yeah, lucky enough, that's the language section. So here I can change the system setting to English instead. After that, let's go ahead and fix these configuration problems. So we'll go into controls and turn off the on-screen touch controls. And also under graphics, we can see what configurations they have set by default. They have frame skipping set here to a percentage of FPS, and then it's using a 1x resolution. Now to fix that stretching issue, we're going to want to go into the display layout editor, as you can see here. And for this part, I recommend using the touchscreen controls. What you want to do is press the options section and then select auto scaling. That's going to preserve the original aspect ratio of the PSP, but also stretch it as big as it can. Okay, so here we are running PlayStation Portable with a 1x resolution and an auto frame skip on. And as you can see, it's not running that great. Honestly, this is one of those times where I think it's better just to use the Linux version. They spend a lot of time customizing that and optimizing it, so I would just use that instead. I think really when it comes down to it, the most optimized way of playing with this front end is going to be using the RetroArch based emulators. So for example, if you want to play classic systems like NES or Game Boy Advance, as you can see here, yeah, you can definitely do that with this front end. And yes, it is a lot easier than trying to navigate the Android interface on your own. However, I also find that the Linux based custom firmwares do a much better job of this anyway. And so while I do think this front end works the best with retro based systems, I'm still struggling to find a use case for it since the Linux side works better. In fact, in my review of the RG353P and then my custom firmware video that I did a couple days after that, my recommendation was to use Linux for everything except for Nintendo 64. For that one in particular, the Android based app, which is called Moopin FZ, does a lot better of a job than it does on Linux. But here's the ironic thing about that front end. They didn't use that app with this custom Android build. And so if I press select in the Nintendo 64 emulator menu, you can see that the only options you have here are running the two different RetroArch cores. And these perform much worse than that standalone app that I recommend. 
And unfortunately, even if you added that app to your Android build, I don't see a way of adding that configuration here. So for those high-end systems like Nintendo 64, this actually reduces the playability altogether. In fact, the performance here using the Nintendo 64 cores with RetroArch is actually about the same as it is with the Linux custom firmware. So again, I sound like a broken record, but I'm not really sure what this use case is gonna be here. While it does improve the functionality of the Android system, it actually reduces the available performance. Now, if you wanna just leave the game mode and get back to a regular Android operating system, that's also possible. To do that, you would just scroll down from the top and then press that Amronic button again. And there we go, we're back into an Android interface. So here you can sideload your apps or use the Aurora store to download new ones and you'll be good to go with just the regular version of Android that we had before, which again, sadly does not have the Google Play Store. And so yeah, that's a look at the new Ambernic based front end for Android. And as I've shown in this quick video here, you know, I'm not really sure what the point of this front end is gonna be. Yes, it does make navigating through your systems easier on the Android side, but the sheer amount of customizability on the Linux side really outweighs what we can find here. And so my recommendation when I first made that custom firmware video still stands with the RG353P. I recommend using a custom firmware like Jealous or the Retro Arena on the Linux side for every system all the way up to Dreamcast. For Nintendo 64, I do recommend using the Android side, but unfortunately, as we saw, this front end doesn't actually work with the app that I would recommend using. Either way, it's kind of cool that Amronic is at least trying to improve the user experience for a device that's already been released. And I hope they continue working on it because at some point, this actually might be worth using. But for now, if you already have Android configured the way you want on the RG353P, I really don't think it's going to be worth it to flash that Android build to get this one instead. Anyway, let me know what you think of the front end here in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.